Jeff Cousins. Um, previously, I was in Chicago for about 30 years doing this type of surgery up there, and then they offered me a ridiculous amount of money to come to Springfield, and uh, you know, I decided I would come down here, and one of the reasons I wanted to come down here was, of course, because of Dr. Elby. Dr. Elby is really world famous, and you're, we're very lucky to have him down here in Springfield. Um, I'm going to go backtrack a little bit here and talk a little bit about anatomy uh, of the brain. Um, you know, the the brain. People look at the brain; they think it's just a bowl of jello or something like that up there. And you can make um, jello look like but the brain, but the point is the brain really isn't a bunch of jello. It's got a very definite structure to it. I always uh, the the thinking part of the brain is. I don't have a good pointer up here. The thinking part of the brain is this major part up here, and then this is this part back here has to do with coordination of movements, and that all funnels through through the, the brain stem and down into the spinal cord. And as you know, the the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. And by the way, I want to thank Dr. Elby for posing for this picture. I think that the brain has, you know, the outside of the brain has got some very distinct lobes of the brain. You've heard of people having lobectomies and lobotomies. And they have different functions for different parts of those areas of the brain. And how do we know those functions? Well, because we can, we can test these areas of the brain and see where the, what functions to do what. The left side of the brain also controls language in most people, and dexterity of the right hand, and the ability to classify and general routine behavior. The right side of the brain is involved with reacting to emergencies and organizing things spatially, recognizing faces and processing emotions and music, et cetera, et cetera. So people sometimes look at this as the left side of the brain is the organized part of the brain, and the right side of the brain is the fun side of the brain. And of course, there's gender differences. Here's the top is the man's brain, and the one down below is the woman's brain. And everything, of course, is connected to everything else. This is a map of the fiber tracks inside the brain that connect all the neurons with each part, other part of the neuron, of the brain. What we're dealing with is the, the central processing unit that's in deep inside the brain. This, uh, the, the, you can see there's the two, the right and left thalamus, and that's connected into the cerebellum and the hypothalamus. And this is the area that has to do with a lot of the control of the movements. And when you're a medical student, you look at this type of diagram for this, but in reality, what the, it's simpler just to think about it this way. That in a normal brain, there are deep areas that promote movement, and there's deep areas that inhibit movement. And they have to be in balance. You can't have too much movement, and you can't have too little movement. What happens in Parkinson's disease is that that areas of the brain that promote movement are decreased somehow. They don't can't produce do they can't produce enough of the chemical that makes movement go, and so they're they're uh, down. And so it's it's unbalanced. And the areas that inhibit movement are more active, and they overwhelm the part areas that promote movement. And the hallmark of Parkinson's disease is that people just don't move. The, the tremor is uh, uh, just sort of a byproduct of that, but it's not really the major part of it. The major part of it, as you know, I'm sure, is that you get inhi inhibition of movement. Now, uh, how do we deal with that? Well, for years, people have been trying to in stimulate parts of the brain. You know, there was these ads years ago that said uh, the ideal brain tonic, you know, but basically that was uh, caffeine and, and, of course, you know, uh, 120 years ago, there was cocaine in there, too. Um, there's a, here's another ad for the po popular French tonic wine. It says, fortifies the brain. But modern times, you know, the, the, the best drug we have to do this that does the same thing is cinnamon or cinnamon. And, and most of you, I'm sure, are, are taking this or, or know of this drug. And it works very, very well. But there's complications that are associated with this, and you know, Dr. Elby's gone over some of this, but the, there's the dyskinesias, which are the abnormal movements that he was talking about. There's psychiatric side effects, sleep disturbances, hallucinations, psychosis, and then of course you get the motor fluctuations. And eventually you get loss of efficacy. 
Dr. Elby's already shown you some of these slides, but I'm just going to go over it again, that you, you start out in the morning, and, and this is down here where it says A-connect, that means no movement. And then you got an area of normal movement, and up here you get too much movement. That's dyskinesias. And so you start and you take your dose, you wake up in the morning, you take your dose of Veldopa, or the cinnamon, and then you get into an area where you got normal movement. This is considered to be on, this is off, this is on, and you spend some time in here, but then you overshoot a little bit and you're moving too much. And then the medication starts to wear off and you get down into the area of normal movement, and eventually it wears off even more where you're not moving anymore, and you take your next dose of, of uh, Cinemet, and then you start getting, going through this all, all through the day. And what you really want to do is spend all your time in this area here, but sometimes you can't do that. And Dr. Elby, you know, talked about that at, at length. And sometimes these can be very erratic or random. And some people spend, you know, very little time in the area of normal movement, and they're either spending in where they've got the abnormal movements, the dyskinesias, or they're bradykinesic, meaning they're not moving. What we do here with, uh, again, so here's a, the, the situation with Parkinson's disease. What we do with surgery, we can't, with surgery, we can't uh, be, act like the drugs. We can't make this better. We can't bring that up. But what we can do is that we can decrease the other side. So it's now you're back in balance. And so by putting an electrode in the areas that inhibit movement, we're scrambling the signals that come out of this area. And what that does is that that puts it back in balance. And so people are back in balance. And we can tune that because it's, 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 a, it's an electrical current and it's got, we can tune the frequency and the voltage and everything. And we can tune it just to the right amount of distance uh, of, to bring that down. As Dr. Elby mentioned, years ago, we didn't have that capability. This is an article that was, for some inexplicable reason, my, my wife you know, dragged me to a garage sale, and I found this magazine here, and up here at the top, it says, new operation for the shaking palsy, and this is from 1957. And here, these, these doctors were putting, uh, they were cre basically creating little strokes in people's brains. They were trying to bring down that area of the brain that causes too much, uh, or um, that they're trying to get it back in balance by causing a little stroke. And like I say, we don't do that anymore. We put an electrode in there. So um, it's used for Parkinson's disease. It's also used for essential tremor. Uh, sometimes people with dystonia, it can use people who have abnormal movements that stay like this all the time. That can help. Uh, we're, we're, we have permission from the Food and Drug Administration now to try it for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, there's studies going on throughout the country to try and treat this, treat depression with this. Uh, and of course, morbid obesity would be the holy grail of deep brain stimulation surgery to try and if we could control people's appetite with this type of thing. Um, and memory disorders, there's, that's very experimental is to try and help increase someone's memory. And of course, everything's underneath the skin. You know, I often show this, this diagram to people um, and they say, well, you know, why are the wires all outside the skin? Well, this is just a cartoon. This is, you know, the, this is sort of a diagram to show that everything, everything, this is where the stuff is, but it's all underneath the skin. And there's a, there's a sort of a picture of the electrode that goes in the brain. The, the pacemaker is about the size, you can see the size of it, and there's the electrode on the left. Uh, and it has a computer that programs this. The advantages of this are that it's flexible, we can, we got different electrodes, we got different parameters, we can do, do, do different types of stimulation. We're not creating a stroke. Um, and if you, people don't like it, we can just turn it off. There are disadvantages, there are um, risks with this that sometimes some people can have a stroke with it. We don't intend to give them a stroke, but sometimes it can happen. Sometimes these things can get infected or you can break a wire or you can, the thing will erode through the skin. And some people don't like the, the, the the cosmetic effects. Some people don't like the little lump under the clavicle or uh, wire of the skin behind the ear. And of course, you have to change the battery every now and then. You know, every four or five years, you have to change the battery. So the people who are candidate are people who have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. That means Parkinson's disease uh, from no known cause. There are some people who can get Parkinson's disease because they're welders or they get um, 
they, they've been boxers or something like that. Uh, but th this is for people who get Parkinson's disease from the normal way people get Parkinson's disease, which is called idiopathic. And it has to be a response to L-DOPA. Um, people who have severe dyskinesias and motor fluctuations are good candidates. And we try to exclude people with dementia and severe medical illness, mainly because it's, it involves some surgery. We have to weigh the risks versus the benefits. But people who have bad dementia, they often have a lot of brain atrophy and they're more likely to get strokes. So this is a graph of severity of the illness over time. Uh, when people are down in this honeymoon period at the first part, they don't, the, the, any, every drug will work and so they don't need to have deep brain stimulation. Um, then there's other people who are too far gone at the other end, but what we try to do is we want to try and catch people in this period, be trying to get their life back into this area of the, of the, um, of their progression of the disease. People can get back and play golf or they can, uh, you know, be with their family, go with their grandchildren to the zoo and things like that. They can go through, I had one patient tell me, you know, he says, oh my God, I can go through a revolving door. You know, he says, I couldn't do that a while ago. Now I can go through a revolving door. It's things that, that you know, people who don't have Parkinson's disease take for granted, but uh, um, mean a lot to people with bad Parkinson's disease. We try to use a technique that uh, we, we've been doing this for over, I've been doing this over, for over 16 years, uh, and we've tried to refine our technique to try and maximize efficacy and outcome and reduce cost and increase patient comfort and acceptance of the whole thing. We have little maps that show us where we're supposed to go in the brain. If you want to buy a map like this, you can buy that for about $700 and on eBay if you want. It's a big book. There's the reference if you want to call your book dealer. Um, and But it's maps of the different structures inside the brain and it's sort of like an atlas that tells us where we, where we need to go. We also have computerized atlases that show us where we're, where we're sticking the electrode. Um, there, some people use frame, a, a frame to do the surgery. Some people do it frameless. Um, this is what the frame looks like. Um, we stick it on somebody's head. We have a localizing frame that, that's in the head. Patients tolerate this very well. But when we put the frame on, your people are sedated so much that they don't care what the hell we're doing to them. So it's, it's actually it's not too bad. We, then we go down to MRI scan. We get an MRI scan with the frame in place. We, we, we're down there checking the MRI scan with the frame in place to make it all, sure it's all done. And then we take, take the patient back up to the operating room. We have to still have to write things down. Uh, we can't put, do it all on computer. You can see I've got a fountain pen. The results of surgery are much better if you use a fountain pen than they are if they don't use a fountain pen. Um, this is the operating room. Uh, these are the operating rooms that we presently have at St. John's. I can tell you they're building brand new operating rooms and I think within about a month or two we're going to be in the brand new operating rooms here at St. John that are just state of the art. They're just absolutely beautiful. Um, we drill a little hole in the head. Uh, sometimes the power tools don't work and we have to use a hand drill. Um, then we, we have to set the, the uh, uh, micro drive for the micro electrode and then we start recording from the patient. You can see this, this gentleman is having the surgery and he's, he's awake here. You can, just, you can see his eyes and he's got the frame on his head and I've got, I'm beyond this sterile barrier and I'm doing, we're doing the recording of the, of the brain activity. We do recording of the brain activity because we want to make sure we're in exactly the right spot. This little area that we're going to is about the size of a P and we want to make sure that we're in the middle of that P. I, I don't have this hooked up to the sound so you can't hear what it is, but when you hear it, we, we listen to the, record, the firing of each of the neurons in the brain and it is uh, like raindrops on a tin roof. It's, it's, it's very distinctive when you know that you're in the right spot. We're always checking the computer to make sure that we're in the right spot. Um, just another picture in the operating room. We turn the lights off because the, not just to make the pictures look better for the lecture here, but we turn the lights off when we do the surgery because the, the lights cause interference to the recording uh, electrodes. And so we have to have the uh, we turn the lights off to reduce the 60 cycle noise. 
So the Pransko aspects, like I said, we want to be in the middle of that P. Um, and we, we pass the electrode several times sometimes to make sure that we're in exactly the right spot. Dr. LB is checking for symptoms and uh, here he's checking someone's foot to make sure that they're moving just like he wants it to. Um, so basically I'm on one side of the screen and he's on the other side. Here at one point I've bro broken scrub to write something down on the, uh, with Dr. Ping. Um, so there's Dr. Elby on one side of the sterile barrier and I'm on the other side and we work as a team to, to make sure that we're in the right spot. Uh, here the patient is doing the, the type of movement where he goes back to the nose and to the Dr. Elby's hand. Um, here I'm changing the, um, the contact for the electrode stimulation. Here's a little example again of that electrode. Uh, we want to make sure that we're in the middle of the subthalamic nucleus. If we're in the other parts, we can cause some side effects. If we're too far off to the sensory side, then people will get electric shock type of sensation. If we're too off to the motor side, people will get abnormal movements, which we don't want. Dr. Elby is, is working very hard. He keeps an eye on me while I'm doing the surgery, and I keep an eye on him while he's doing his part. Um, but here you can see that this is a different patient, but the, he's awake and, and while we're doing the whole surgery. So we usually start in the morning. We start very early, 7 a.m. Uh, we put the frame on. We go down to MRI about 7.30. We're back up in the operating room around 9. We're starting to record in the operating room about 10 a.m. About 11 o'clock, we, we're, we're putting in the, we take out the, the, the recording electrode and we put in the stimulating electrode. Then we close that incision and then we go have lunch and lunch is pretty good at St. John's Hospital. And then uh, we, uh, while we're at lunch, the patient is then, um, they're put under general anesthesia. And so part of the operation is done under general anesthesia because when we pass the electrode from up here down to the, where the pulse generator is, we can't do that under local anesthesia. Somebody has to be under general anesthesia for that. And we're usually done about 1 p.m. Today we, were, we did a case and we were done by noon. Sometimes it takes a little longer, sometimes it takes uh, a shorter time. Benefits, as I said, uh, they're pretty good. This is dyskinesias. Uh, the dyskinesias, this is before surgery and after surgery, the amount of time that's spent in hours per day in dyskinesias drops dramatically with surgery. This is the average of the group. Here's um, uh, another one where it's gone uh, way down. The time that you're on where you've got normal movement goes way up. Here, this is baseline. And then here's after 12 months after surgery, the time that you're spending in that area where you have more normal movement goes way, way, way up. If you look at overall um, motor outcome, uh, you can see this is a graph that shows that people uh, of all the, uh, these patients who've had uh, uh, surgery, um, one patient I think was, was worse. Uh, there are a few that were, there was no change in their motor symptoms, but the majority of them were way over here. Some were greatly, greatly improved. The people who were greatly, greatly improved were way over here. So this is sort of a graph that's showing that the majority of patients, not only do they get better, but they get really better. If you take those other people that are off to the side, uh, you lump all the people versus just worse versus unchanged versus improved, you can see that there's a great uh, amount of people who are improved. You put that in a pie chart and you can see that 1% or worse, 7% are unchanged, and 92% of people will have some improvement in their Parkinson's symptoms. Um, if you try to define the people that are over in the far right as having significant improvement or, or you know, greatly improved, then you can say that 71% of people will have a, a lot of improvement in their Parkinson's symptoms, 21% will have some improvement in their Parkinson's symptoms, and then 7% will be unchanged and 1% will be worse. So for the majority of people, this is a very good operation. I looked at our, that, that was from a, da, a study that was done by the Medtronic people. This is. This is our own data, and it sort of shows exactly the same thing. There's more, 95% are improved, and very few are, are worse or unchanged. This is uh, 
looking at, so what symptoms of this, does it improve? This is a graph that shows that the, the farther away you are from the center, the more improvement that you will have. And here's, you can say this is mood and apathy, dyskinesias, motor fluctuations, tremor, bradykinesia, that means the, the, the rigidity. And then you get sleep and autonomic function, depression, cognition. It doesn't really change, it changes more of the motor things than it does the non-motor things of Parkinson's disease. There is some change, but not a whole lot. But most of the change that you see is over here on this side where the motor, uh, motor symptoms are changed. I went to a website, uh, I'm represent neurosurgery to a national organization called the Physicians Consortium for Performance Improvement, and, and one of the speakers at this conference last week in Washington was a, from a website called patientslikeme.com. I thought at first it was patients like me, you know, <laughs> but no, no, it's patients like me, you know, dot com. And they had a thing that had... Uh, uh, about Parkinson's disease, and if you are interested in looking at what other people are saying, not what just doctors and drug companies say, but what real patients are saying, this is a good website to go to. But here, this website, they talked about the uh, the patient's uh, perceptions of how whether they got better with uh, DBS surgery. And here you can see the, the dark blue. This is most patients had what they called a major improvement. Uh, the lighter blue is moderate improvement. Uh, this is slight improvement. And um, then over here, you know, the patients who were sort of unchanged were over here. So most patients have a, a big improvement in their symptoms. But of course, there's risks. And, uh, you know, we, we, it's our job to tell you about the risks. There's risk of infection and bleeding, anesthesia complications, and medical complications. Um, we try to get people at their best and tuned up before we do the surgery to make sure that we minimize those as we can. There's a risk of a stroke and infection and wire breakage and battery failure. I mentioned that before. We usually remove the staples, uh, the sutures, in about 10 to 14 days after the operation. We don't turn the thing on right away after the surgery because sometimes just having the electrode in there will... Um, cause a, a resolution of the symptoms. And so we don't know what to tune and what not to, to tune. And so we have to wait till all that swelling has gone down. And then uh, we do the, the programming of the, of the uh, electrode. Um, and then we usually do one side at a time because the main reason is because some people get better with just one side being done. They don't have to have the other side done. Uh, the other reason is because Medicare will only pay for doing one side at a time, and so we just do one side. But uh, then we usually, so we usually wait about four to six weeks and then do the other side. This is a book that is out you know, called Life of the Battery Operated Brain. It's a patient's guide to deep brain stimulation surgery. I'm sort of nervous about sh showing this because I haven't actually read this book. I just found this book the other day, and I guess, you know, I, for all I know, she's saying that the thing is horrible and it'll be terrible, but... I haven't read it, but I, I think I've, read, I've seen the review about it, and it looks like it's a pretty good book. Um, here's a, the number. Is this still the right number people call? I hope it is. Yeah. For people, if, if you're interested in the deep brain stimulation surgery, you really need to get a referral from your neurologist. Um, you need to see me at some point, but you need to see Dr. Elby first because, like I say, we work as a team, and Dr. Elby really has to decide whether you truly are a candidate, if maybe some other drugs might be uh, helpful first. Uh, he also has to see you because um, he's the guy who tests you in the operating room, so he has to get a really good exam of you before you go to the operating room because he'll be testing you in the operating room. Um, but after the surgery, you can still go back to your neurologist. We're not stealing you from your neurologist. That we will we'll, we'll help you with the surgery, but uh, um, Dr. Elby might want to do the initial programming, but your neurologist uh, can still be taking care of you. And that's really all I have to say. So the patient that I anticipated being here, and I had a video, uh, isn't here, but Mr. Hunt is here. That's a good thing. So... So I'm going to show you a video of Mr. Hunt before the um, before the surgery. Um, that's him.
And uh, you can see he had a very bad tremor in the left hand. Actually, pretty bad tremor in both hands. For some reason, the tremor is often very refractory to the medication. Um, it's curious that it is. And then on the other hand, every now and then we get lucky, and I say lucky because I have no explanation for it, but the patient will come in on levodopa and be wonderful. Um, I can't say enough good about the surgery, except they wouldn't give me any more hair, though. <laughs> I asked if they could get a couple, you know, a couple, uh, put some plugs in, they didn't, but... Uh, um, before my first one, which was August 27th of last year, I, um, God, did I have, uh, um, oh, I was scared to death, okay? I mean, is it going to hurt? They're going to drill a hole in my head and uh, all these things. And it did not hurt. I came in on Monday, they got all the meds out of my system. Tuesday, they did the operation. Tuesday night, I was up walking around. Wednesday, I went home. I had my second one done, my, my left side, my right hand, January 7th. And um, it's, it's, fantastic what this will do. I was, um, unfortunately, I've had Parkinson's for almost 12 years, and um, we were starting to look for a nursing home for me. That's how bad it was getting. Before I could get out of bed in the morning, I have to think about, oh, God, I don't know how many pills, and they just didn't last, and What can I say except that I do have a little problem with the uh, slurred speech every once in a while, but see that uh, I don't do that anymore. Thank you.